Well, hello. My name is John Campbell, and I'm here today to record this program, God Day, and I don't know whether you're going to see it in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, or the middle of the night, but um, that doesn't really matter because God's Word goes forth to achieve that for which it is sent. And this morning I want to talk to you about a subject which I think we're all concerned about. It all, it, we, we're all concerned about it in the sense that it strikes home in all our lives at some point, and that's why is my healing delayed? And I know others have talked about this on, uh, on God Morning. It doesn't make it any less relevant. Um, as the Lord leads us, we perhaps come with a slightly different angle. And the, the whole point is that I'm not dictating to you, but I'm trying through my own experience to help you see the truth about healing. Now, I have a confession to make. Um, I have been uh, severely tested and I am continually tested very gently by the Lord. But my wife, Shauna, has frontotemporal dementia and it is quite advanced. Uh, she was diagnosed in 2013, although the fine diagnosis of what type of dementia it was was not until a few years later. But nevertheless, this is a huge challenge because we all know people that die of dementia, or we know of people that die of dementia, and yet I, I could not believe that this was the Lord's will for her life. And so I had to be clear where I stood and what I understood about healing uh, for believers. Um, and it has been a journey for me and I'm sure a journey for you because we all know people who have died of sickness and disease who perhaps shouldn't have done. Perhaps they, were, they died early and uh, or, or there didn't seem to be any response to prayer. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? And I want to start by reading uh, from Matthew chapter 8, and I'm going to read the first 17 verses. Matthew chapter 8. Now, I would recommend that you learn these verses by heart. Uh, they're not difficult to learn. Um, in fact, they're really quite easy to learn. Now when Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, Show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying sick at home, is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy you should come under my roof but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and served him. And when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Well, it's a wonderful piece of scripture, and it teaches us a number of things. There are three 
actually there are more than three examples of healing there. there there's, there's, there's four, including the masses who were healed and delivered at the end. They're the fourth group of people. And we, what we see from this, this scripture is we see the willingness of Jesus to heal. There was no question, are you willing? I am willing. But we also see the readiness to heal. It's all very well, the Lord could have said, I'm willing and done nothing. But he didn't. He immediately to the leper, he said, I'm willing and put out his hand. And the leper was cleansed. Of course, <laughs> Jesus' hand would not have touched the leper until he actually was cleansed. Because if he had, he would have broken the law, which would have been impossible. So as his hand went forward to touch the leper, the leper would have been healed. So we see the willingness and the immediate, um, uh, the, 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 the immediate readiness to heal. That's the first one. And the next one is the centurion. And here we learn that vicarious healing, as it were, healing at a distance, is, is no more difficult to the Lord, and he's no less ready to do it than he is, was, was for the leper. So here comes the centurion, believing for his servant. We don't know whether his servant was a believer or not. We don't know anything about him, except that he was um, near death. But the law, the, 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 the centurion interceded for him as a believer, as he'd heard about the Lord, he must have believed in the Lord, um, and, and he, he, he brought his request to the Lord and said, the, your word is enough. And indeed it was enough. And so, although the Lord wasn't physically present with his servant, at that point, the servant was healed. And then the story moves on, the day moves on, and they come into, into Peter's house where his mother-in-law is unwell. And on this occasion, the Lord touches her, the fever leaves her, and she gets up and serves them dinner. And it mustn't have been a very peaceful dinner for the Lord because the, the, the crowd were gathering. The crowd was growing outside the house. You can just imagine it. You can imagine them peering in the windows and climbing up on the roof. The word had gone out that this man, this man Jesus, who was able to heal the sick, was here. And Jesus, in his grace and mercy, went out and healed them and, de and delivered them where there was necessary. Probably, in many cases, it was deliverance and healing. And we're told that he did it for this wonderful reason, this wonderful reason where uh, the scripture quotes from Isaiah 53, um, in verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now, What's so interesting about that is that Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. So what was the authority for him being able to use that scripture in order to heal and deliver people? Well, of course, there's only one answer, and that is the lamb, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. God stands outside time, and, and the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, and that, that's, that sacrifice is the authority for the uh, salvation of the Old Testament saints, the, those who are believers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and the others who, who believed. That is the authority. And for us, the authority is the, 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 the lamb that was slain here at, on Calvary 2,000 years ago. But those who are cessationists in the church, uh, particularly in the established church, though not exclusively so, who say that Isaiah 53 is all about spiritual healing, are rather stumped by this scripture because it's quite clear that physical healing and physical deliverance are included in those verses from Isaiah. You, it's impossible to refute it because here Jesus heals and delivers based upon those scriptures. He is fulfilling those scriptures. And he hasn't ceased to fulfill them because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So here in these few verses, these 17 verses, and I do counsel you to, to, to try and learn them by heart because when you're faced, or perhaps you're being faced, with the problem of somebody who's critically ill, possibly terminally ill in your, in, in your family, amongst your group of people and your friends and people you love, 
then there's all you need in this scripture to hang on to and move forward in the Lord. So let's settle once and for all um, the, the question of whether the Lord is willing to heal. He is willing. And how many times did the leper have to ask him? Once. How many times did the centurion have to ask him? Once. Now, this is very important because it's very easy to keep going back to the Lord and saying, Lord, please heal me. Please heal my wife. Please heal whoever. Please heal. The man and woman of faith must understand that they only need go once because the answer from the throne of God is immediate. Come boldly to the throne of grace and seek help and mercy in your time of need. And you get it. And the, in, in, John, in 1 John, we're told that if, if we, whatever we ask, if we ask according to the will of God, then we know, we know he hears us. And if we know he hears us, we know that we have the answer. So when you say, Lord, please heal, the immediate answer from the throne is yes. And it's immediate as we see in the scriptures we saw today. There was no delay between the Lord expressing his willingness to heal and his doing it. So that's the scriptural and spiritual truth. But we recognize that delays are very common, that delays are everywhere, that indeed delays are uh, uh, sometimes delayed to the point when the person doesn't survive and they die. Now, sometimes people die of sickness and disease because it's just their time to go home. But we're not talking about that. We all have to die one day. We're talking about premature death. Why does premature death occur? And why do people suffer with chronic disease, not necessarily leading to, 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 to death, but robbing them of life? And we know that the devil comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, and he does it in that order. So let's try and understand this better. You know, doctors who certainly is probably less so today, but historically I've read that when doctors were learning to be doctors and they were studying in hospital and they were looking at corpses and looking at the, 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 the human skeleton and the human organs and the whole human anatomy and biology, the one thing that hit them was the perfection of the design. Now going base goes takes us back to creation. When God created Adam, he created him perfect. And Eve was similarly perfect because she was taken from Adam who was perfect. The perfect man, the perfect woman, no disease, no sickness, no deformity, no germs, no viruses, no nothing. An example of man and woman made in the image of God, showing how what God's idea, what God's concept of a wholesome, healthy human being should be. And doctors, as they study the anatomy of the human being, are by and large overwhelmed by the perfection of the design. They can't help to be. And they can hold a brain in their hand, a human brain in their hand, and be overawed by this lump of flesh, which is more powerful than the most powerful computers that can organize your whole body from birth, well, from conception to death, and that it is perfectly designed, perfectly decompartmentalized, a perfect piece of electronic neuroengineering. And that goes on right down through the body, through the physique, through the organs, through the cells, through the perfection of the way the organs work together, supporting one another, through the way the immune system works, attacking anything, any alien creature that comes in. And, and it's just utterly wonderful, wonderful. The, 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 the mark of the design of God is all over the human body. And yet, the thing they also notice is the, the imperfections how this perfection has been marred. It's been the physically beautiful is no longer the physically beautiful. And whereas in the creation of, of Adam, there was no sickness, no disease, no abnormalities, no deformities, 
no mental conditions, no phobias, no bad attitudes, no bitterness, no hatred, all without sin, perfect, and they just trusted God. And yet, this is not what we see in the body today. The, 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 the beautiful, perfect pattern is there, but it is marged. It's marred, rather. It's marred and, 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 and it's, it's been brought down to the point where it no longer works as it should, where disease is, has impacted it, where deformity has impacted it, where age has impacted it, all these things that shouldn't have happened. And they're there for one reason. They're there because of sin. Now, sometimes when I'm talking to Christians about this, they get very offended. Please don't be offended. Please don't be offended when I tell you that sin is the reason for your disease. There's no other cause but sin. Sin has the right or gives the, the, the demonic realm right to inflict disease and infection and pain upon you, and it does. And we're talking about legal rights. Now, it's not necessarily you, because I'm quite sure you, you are under the blood of Christ and you've repented of your past, but there can be historical sin, historical iniquity, historical transgression, which has come down the line from your ancestors. And you know, with the best will in the world, none of us know what our ancestors were up, were up to. And so I, I, I have this picture in my mind, I'm not saying it's accurate, but it helps me understand. It's accurate enough to help us understand that you go to the throne of God, you you plead with the Lord to heal you or a loved one, and he says yes. And his word goes forth to achieve that for which it is sent. He tells us. But that word goes out. This is about government now. This is about God's government. That word goes out through the courts of heaven, where it gets the stamp of approval. It's like in our parliament, uh, a, a, an, an act is passed, but it has to have the stamp of approval, and it goes through a process before it actually becomes law. And this is no different in heaven. The Lord issues an instruction. That instruction goes forth unless it can be legally stopped. And there's where the problem lies. It goes out through the court of heaven where it'll have the stamp of approval, but Satan is there. Satan is the, is the counsel for the prosecution. And believe me, he is an expert lawyer. And he will search through the annals of history of all your antecedents and indeed all your history. He will search through to find a reason why this instruction for your healing should not go forth and in most of us he'll find one. That's the raw truth. In most of us he will find one. And it isn't a problem for us to deal with it, but we must deal with it. And so Satan will say, as it were, this cannot go forth because this person's great, great, great grandmother practiced witchcraft or this person's great, great, great grandfather was a high-ranking Freemason. It could be anything. It could be a whole myriad of things. And if you look in Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30, you'll see a whole raft of reasons why curses can come upon you and your generations. And what we're talking about through sickness is it actually a curse. And so that curse needs to be lifted and it can be lifted legally. How can it be lifted legally? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because Jesus had paid the price that you can no longer be accused. But we're dealing with a legal system. You see, if you're acquitted in a court, but you're not in court and don't know about that acquittal, then it will not manifest in your life. If you discover that, um, you have been wrongly accused of something, in, I'm talking about in the natural now, and you go to court, and that wrong accusation is resulting in you perhaps having a hefty fine served upon you, uh, but one that is unjust, 
Um, but you don't go to court to hear the judge or the magistrate acquit you and say not guilty. You will still feel under the burden of that fine. You will not understand that the fine has been paid because you didn't go to court. So it's incumbent upon us to attend the courts of heaven by faith. Listen, don't, don't be burdened by faith. And uh, there's some wonderful teaching out, out there on it. A, a, a person I thoroughly recommend to you is Robert Henderson. Done some wonderful teaching. You can find him on YouTube. He's written some wonderful books. Um, uh, he and others, but I thoroughly recommend Robert Henderson to teach you, if you don't know, about entering the courts of heaven in order to have those things that are giving the devil a right to inflict you or your loved ones with a disease which is an alien, which is a trespasser in your life, and to have it dealt with. Have it dealt with whatever is thrown at you in the court, whatever accusation, either on your own behalf or on behalf of your, your bloodline. Now, it can get a bit complicated, because remember, you are one with your spouse. You are one with any previous spouses. You are one with any person that you have had illicit sex with in the past. And so that oneness can result in whatever is in their bloodline to affect you too. So leave no stone unturned, but know this, that it was all dealt with at Calvary. And go in and plead guilty to whatever is thrown at you and hold your hand up and say guilty and turn to the judge, the righteous judge, and say, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ, my savior. And the judge will say, not guilty. Then ask for a restraining order against all those spirits that have been responsible for accusing you and bringing these things into your life. Now, that's that. But you might say, or you might find that still the healing doesn't manifest. And I've done all this for my own wife. I've gone in on her part. She's incapable of repenting. She doesn't have the mental capacity to do that. But I can do it for her. And I've been through everything I know. And don't beat yourself up about what's going on in your bloodline. You can only know what you know and what the Holy Spirit tells you. Don't beat yourself up trying to find out because otherwise you'll be into works. And here's the problem. Works. You, get, you do all this stuff and now you're in works. And the Lord has been dealing with me about this recently. Just simple faith. Just believe. You've come to me. You've asked for healing. I've given you healing. You've dealt with every legal issue. Now it is simple faith. Simple faith. Not complicated faith. Not worked up faith. Not working yourself up until you believe. Just simple faith. In the, in the willingness and the ability of the Lord to heal. And there may be a reason that the, uh, uh, that the healing hasn't happened yet, and it might to do with you. I, I believe that in my wife's case, the he, the, everything's in place for the healing. It hasn't manifested yet because the Lord is teaching me so much through her. So much that I've shared with you this morning has been because of what's happening in her life. And I wouldn't have learned it. I wouldn't have been able to share it with you if she had been healed immediately. What I can say to you is she's not deteriorated for the last nine months or so, seven months. She's not deteriorated. And the Lord said to me the other day when I say he said to me, I sensed he was saying to me, look at her. She's safe. She's got a roof over her head. She's washed and dressed and clothed and fed. She's perfectly safe. She doesn't know what's going on in the world and what a blessing that is. In the meantime, while I make, I, I, I sustain her as she is and I'm using her as a teaching tool for you. And this can sometimes be the case. I'm not saying it so in every case, but it can be the case. And so never give up. Don't beat yourself up. Don't tell yourself, as the devil will tell you, that your faith is not good enough. Just be faithful and trust God. You know, the, the, the Old Testament verse most often quoted in the New Testament is that wonderful verse from Habakkuk. I think it's Habakkuk 3, 2, but it might be Hab Habakkuk 2, 3. It's, but you know the one I mean. The just shall live by faith. 
But the Hebrew understanding of that is, is actually much more helpful. It is the just shall live by faithfulness to their God. And how are we faithful to our God? We're faithful by simply believing him. Yes, we have to do all that we need to do to clear the airways, and we expect to do that because that's part of God's government, and it's part of us as growing, it's part of us understanding our, our heritage, part of us understanding who we are in the Lord. But once all that's done, just continue to pray, plead the blood of Jesus, thank the Lord for the healing, and have simple, thankful trust in the Lord. Thank you, Lord that Shauna is healed. Thank you, Lord, that so-and-so is healed. Thank you. Not aggressive, carnal thanks, but restful, peaceful, faithful thanks. Because without faith, we cannot please God. And what is not of faith is sin, the scripture tells us. Now that's a challenge. What is not of faith is sin. So whether you are, as it were, well sick, by that I mean is you have a condition but you're perfectly mentally with it and can understand, or you are praying for somebody who's very sick and not really able to stand at the moment, they can't stand on their own faith. We, we all know what it's like. When you're very, very poorly, you can't, you can't really do much for yourself. Even faith is, is, is tough, but we can stand in the gap for people. We saw very clearly the centurion standing in the gap for his servant. So wherever you have um, uh, you, you were able to cover somebody, you can stand in the gap for them. And the answer is always, I am willing. So I hope that's blessed you. I hope that has given you hope. I hope it has given you understanding. And if your healing is delayed, it's for a reason, but it's everything the Lord does is good. And he turns everything to good who are the called and who loved him. I hope it's helped you and blessed you. God bless you all. Bye-bye for now.